I'm a researcher, and I work out of a laboratory at the University of British Columbia in Canada. We focus on drugs like cannabis and some psychedelics like LSD and psilocybin mushrooms. I've been really curious how people use these substances to improve their health. So over the past three years, I've teamed up with an international team of scientists to launch the largest study of microdosing. And I'm really pumped to be here to tell you what microdosing is, why people are doing it, and a little bit about if it works. Before I jump into that, I want to acknowledge that my university and home, where most of this research has been conducted, is located on the unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan people. And if we're talking about using psychedelics as a tool for healing, it's important that we recognize that Indigenous people have been the knowledge keepers of these traditions for thousands of years and are the true pioneers in the field. So in the timeline of psychedelics, it's only been a pretty small amount of time that Western culture has been around for. But that said, a lot has happened in the past 70-something years. The mind-altering effects of psychedelics helped to shape the counterculture movement of the 1960s. And now, scientists are exploring the use of large doses of psychedelics as a tool for curing some really hard-to-treat disorders, like post-traumatic stress, depression, and anxiety. If there's one word that characterizes all these different uses of psychedelics, it's big. Big doses are used to create big effects. For a patient going through psychedelic treatment, or even your friend on their way to a Grateful Dead concert, doses are usually big enough to create some sort of trip. You know, colors looking richer, a mystical connection with the universe, or maybe a sprinkling of colors behind closed eyelids. But what I'm here to talk to you about today is not big. In fact, for most psychedelic microdosers, the ideal effects wouldn't create any sort of trip. They'd actually be small enough that they could go about their day doing whatever needs to be done. But even without the trip, psychedelic microdoses appear to be making a real difference in the lives of people taking them. The press is picking up on stories of microdosers who say that the practice has helped them manage mental illness or has saved their marriage. Tech gurus in Silicon Valley testifying to the productivity boost they get from microdosing and comedians, musicians, and artists who use the practice as a part of their creative ritual. True believers are eager to share the wonder of microdosing with the world, but they recognize that the average person wants a scientific stamp of approval before popping LSD on a workday, even if it is a small amount. That said, the microdosing community has gone above and beyond to bring attention to the topic including roping researchers like myself into it. We've now published two papers that collectively have been downloaded over 600,000 times, and it's all thanks to the microdosing community that called out for research and volunteered their time to push science forward. With all that enthusiasm, it's hard not to get swept up into the excitement of microdosing. But still, I like to wade into these topics with some genuine curiosity because there's a lot we don't know. So let's start with what we do know. Our study recruited over 12,000 microdosing participants and thousands more that weren't microdosing so that we could compare the two groups to find out who is microdosing, what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how it's working out for them. We have microdosers join in from across the world, but the majority came from North America, Europe, and Australia. And in general, they didn't look all that different from the people that weren't microdosing, except for maybe being a little bit older and from urban areas. As for what it is, people in our study were microdosing with a few different things, including what are sometimes lovingly referred to as magic mushrooms and some other psychedelics uh, like LSD, MDMA. As for what it is, people in our study were microdosing with a few different things, including what are sometimes referred to as magic mushrooms which contain the psychedelic ingredient of psilocybin, and some other psychedelics like LSD, ketamine, and MDMA. But for the most part, people were using either LSD or psilocybin mushrooms. 
Microdosers have a few different ways of going about their practice, but most commonly, people are taking these psychedelic substances in small doses. Now, even from what I told you, you could tell that the way people are using these substances is very different from what we normally think of as drug use, and really better fits with how someone might take a vitamin or a supplement. In our study, microdosers mostly said they started the practice for health reasons, like to reduce stress or to improve cognition, like the computer programmer that takes a dose at the start of the day to improve their focus. Interestingly, the number one reason our participants said they got into the practice was for mindfulness, which really helps to point to this kind of shared wellness intention across all microdosers. For many, this practice is used as an aid for managing mental health. In fact, one study found that some microdosers reported that it was even more effective than conventional treatments for things like depression and anxiety. So when we designed our study, it was really important that we build in a focus on mental health. And microdosing is a practice that happens over weeks, not days. So we track things like depression, anxiety, and stress over the span of a month. So how did microdosers' mental health change over the course of our study? To answer this question, we took a look at just the people that were microdosing with psilocybin mushrooms. What we found is that over the span of a month, microdosers were in a better mood, were less depressed, less anxious, and less stressed than the people that weren't engaging in the practice. Now, with so many people microdosing for cognitive enhancement and brain health, we felt it was important that we took a look at this area as well. So what we did is we included some measures of cognitive ability, one of which is called the finger tap test. And yes, it's exactly what it sounds like. We asked participants to tap their fingers onto their phone. As simple as it is, this test makes a pretty good proxy for brain health and has been used to spot diseases like Parkinson's. We gave this tap test to everyone in our study, but our brains really change as we get older, so we are sure to look at younger and older people separately. What we found is the same pattern as with mental health. Microdosers' TAP scores grew more over the course of the study than people that weren't microdosing. But interestingly, this was especially true for the people that were over the age of 55, which really helps to point to the potential of microdosing to be making its biggest impact as we age. I mentioned earlier that microdosers tend to have a few different ways of going about their practice. Well, one thing that we picked up on in our study is that more than half of our microdosing participants said that they were combining their psychedelic substances with other non-psychedelic substances in a process called stacking. So what were people mixing together? Well, mostly it was natural products with corresponding health benefits, like cacao, the raw version of chocolate, which is mixed in for mood and mental health, or lion's mane mushrooms that are often put into the mix because they've been suggested to help protect our brains. With all these different combinations appearing, how do we know that what we found is related to the psychedelics and not due to these additional stacked substances? So what we did is we compared our microdosers that were using only psilocybin mushrooms to the ones that stacked with a popular combination consisting of lion's mane mushrooms and niacin. And although all microdoses, stacked and non, were related to more improvement than doing nothing, the stack combination came out on top for TAP score improvement over the month of our study. So, from what it looks like here, the stack combination may have actually been helping to boost some of these microdosing benefits. So, these are just the first things to come out of our study, but many questions remain. At the forefront of these is how expectations might be playing into our findings. Our studies show that microdosers were doing better over time, but is that mostly due to the fact that they thought they were going to get better when they started the study? We didn't tell anyone in our study to start microdosing or to not, so anyone that did probably started because they thought it was going to work. So how much of this mental health and cognition boost that we found is really related to microdosing? And how much of it is due to a placebo effect where our participants started doing better because they expected to? Future studies are on their way to unpacking these questions. And the ones that are emerging 
are working closely with the microdosing community to develop new ways to approach the placebo effect in this context. So for me, as a clinical scientist, it's not my job to say whether microdosing is good or bad, but rather to find ways to walk alongside this group as they find their own path to wellness. Our study asked the question, why are you microdosing? And the resounding response from participants was to be more mindful. And I think the same applies here. Every day, people are becoming increasingly more mindful of their health decisions. Those of you that are empowered to be more thoughtful about your wellness and about your approach to scientific information are bridging the gap that separates science from the public that will hopefully bring us into a future where researchers and the public can work alongside each other to identify and solve problems. Thank you.